So everyone is logging in now and uh, they're probably hearing us. So I think Martha, go ahead and take it away. All right, welcome to Away With Words video cookout number two. Hey, Grant. Hi, Martha, how you doing? I'm great, are you ready? Yes. Well, we're really excited to have all of you here today. I know that we have folks here from uh, Southern California and upstate New York. Uh, we heard uh, yesterday from a couple in uh, in Bulgaria. And so wow. fun Roman, they, they said that they were going to try to get up at 2 a.m. to attend the cookout. So uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> so what coffee is for. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if, if you're oh, out there's, there, there's a hello here. from Sydney. Hi, David. Oh, from Sydney, from somebody named Sydney or Sydney, well, Australia? Well, David in Sydney, Australia. Excellent, excellent. Well, we Sorry, will make it worth your while to be awake at, at whatever hour it is, wherever you are. Um, and I brought an extra spatula if anybody needs it, or do you call it a flipper, Grant? What do you call it? <laughs> spatula, yeah. <laughs> okay, spatula for our cookout because in just a few minutes, you are going to get to grill Grant and me. Oh. <laughs> but before we get started, I just wanted to say that seriously, now that we're getting toward the end of the year, I've been thinking a whole lot about how grateful we are for all of you and for the fact that we get to share uh, this kind of fun with language and, and this uh, educational, entertaining thing that we do with you. You know, for about 15 years now, Grant and I and our producer, Stephanie Levine, have been working really hard to bring you this labor of love every week. And the truth is that we couldn't do it without you, without your wonderful stories, without your messages of, of encouragement, uh, without your thoughtful questions and your insights about language. Your support makes all the difference for us. It really does. You make it possible for us to continue serving the community you live in and uh, listeners around the world. So thank you so much for your support. Uh, if you've been meaning to make a donation to Away With Words, you can always go to waywardradio.org slash donate uh, to, to help keep this show going strong. Um, we're also grateful to Josh Eccles. Josh is the president of the nonprofit that produces Away With Words, Wayward Inc. And uh, he's president of our nonprofit's all volunteer board. And uh, he's gonna be moderating today's event. So props to uh, Josh. Thank you, Josh. And I wanna say some hellos to people in the thread. Hello to Citrus Heights, California and Christine in Adelaide, South Australia. Carl in Vancouver, Canada, who says, that they have a park there named Dude Chilling Park. <laughs> and Mar <laughs> Margaret in Rocket City, MJ in Madison, Wisconsin, Kathy in Melbourne, Australia, uh, uh, Ashley in California, the gold country. Wait, isn't that the whole state, <laughs> Ashley? I think it is. Edward in Southern Wisconsin and Craig in Humboldt County. And we'll get to some more later. Wow, I'm thinking that in a way with words tour of Australia is uh, in the offing, wouldn't you say? For in I would definitely <laughs> say. <laughs> well, we hope you've settled in for our informal cookout. Um, a, a bit of technical housekeeping first. Number one, your computer will run a lot better uh, during this time if you use the speaker view. And as we said, we really want to hear from you. So keep leaving those messages in the Zoom chat and we'll choose a few of those uh, to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, so right now um, you should be auto muted, but during the Q&A time, uh, we'll be calling on folks. So put that question in the chat and, uh, and hope that we choose it. Um, some of you have already uh, taken the uh, opportunity to email us some questions. So we'll be talking about some of those uh, too while you're typing out yours. So um, we really wanna hear from you and, and interact with you. This is just a, a fun, informal cookout. So uh, bring those thoughts and questions. Um, but first, um, even though you all are our really special guests, we do have another special guest and that is John Chinesky. Uh, you, do, you know John, of course, as uh, the Away With Words puzzle guy, but John is also a writer, a comedian, 
musician, and he's a puzzle maker uh, for a lot of different uh, outfits. You may have heard him on uh, NPR's Ask Me Another. And um, he, John is really, Grant, wouldn't you say, he's, he's the least trivial trivia master. <laughs> <laughs> but he's hard to miss. How tall are you, John? Like six, nine, seven, eight? Well, John, show us how tall you are. <laughs> You're muted, dude. <laughs> Josh, has to, I have to unmute you. Hold on a second. <laughs> oh, there we go. Got to ask to unmute you, and now you've got to say yes. Unmute. There we go. There we go. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hi, Grant. Hi, Martha. What was the question again? Uh, how, how tall are you, dude? How tall? I'm six five. Yeah, six foot five. Wow. Yeah. So okay. not trivial at all. <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've been six foot five all your life? I was born six five. Actually, I've since lost weight. I used to, I'm skinnier than I was when I came out. I was uh, big, big. <laughs> he was big born baby. in a giraffe yeah. enclosure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, I'm, as my, my grandmother would say, I'm like, I'm like this. He's, uh -huh. like, he's like this, she'd say. Yeah. <laughs> like a capital L from the side, I guess. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, John, we had a couple of questions for you. Number one. Wait, you have questions for me? We have questions That's for finally, you. That's the, the other way around. <laughs> the tables are being turned here. All right, um, sure. First of all, we know that you've worked as a writer for a number of game shows, including Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And this is, I just imagine that this is sort of like, we know that there's somebody who comes up with the names of those paint chips. You know, when you go to the paint store and you're buying, somebody has to come up with the names of those colors. And right. somebody's got to come up with the, with those questions, but it's, it's you. Yes. You're the guy who does that. So what is it like to write for a show like uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? It's, it's a lot of fun. It's just sitting around in a room and uh, you're basically you're working by yourself, but you have other people to bounce ideas off of. You work in a writer's room. I'm a writer, member of the, of the Writers Guild. I enjoy that. Uh, I, I got the job through, um, they were looking for someone to do the CD-ROM game back in 1999. Uh, CD-ROM <laughs> is a thing, wow. is a device that people <laughs> used to, anyway, so yeah. And uh, back then they were still very worried about, you know, the quiz movies quiz show had come out. Yeah. The producers were worried that they'd be accused of, uh, of uh, chicanery. So uh, we were we were in instructed we had to come into work in the offices. And while we were there, they said, oh, you guys are pretty good. We'll just move you over into the TV show. And that's how I got to work for television for the first time. So you're writing these questions and you yeah. have an editor or 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 yeah, I'm sure usually, you have some great story or two about about. Oh sure, yeah. I usually have a head writer, someone who you always disagree with, as most head you know writers are. Uh, but you know, the producers and the head writer work together to let you know what kind of thing they want. Sometimes it depends on what happens on the show. I remember we once wrote a question. Somebody wrote a question about three blind mice. It was a very simple, easy question. You know, what does she use to cut their tails off? Something like that. But during the question. One. It's a tough one, right? Yeah, it's a poser. Uh, during the question, Regis Philbin, who was our host at the time, he just made a joke, some aside, had nothing to do with the question itself, some joke that the audience loved, went over big time. So then, of course, the word came back from the producers, more questions about mice, please. <laughs> it, they don't, they, it's okay. Producers uh, are generally pretty good, but uh, yeah. yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> So uh, came up with more questions about mice, huh? Yeah, they figured. Yeah, that, that they just look. I said they just look at the uh, the applause meter and they just <laughs> say, "You know, what's it about now?" So yeah, that's that's it. Amy in the chat wants to know if you get to write wacky answers for the first few questions. Do you do oh, that, yeah. and they just throw them out? <laughs> yeah, that that is one thing, which is that usually uh, many writers might know this: is you write something and you you think it's perfectly crafted. But then it has to go through the head writer and it might come back to you. They might say, oh, do something different. But then once you send it, once you're done with it, it goes to the producers. It goes to uh, S&P, Standards and Practices. They have to mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, if you're mentioning a brand name or you're just, you know, it might sound like you're disparaging someone. Once it gets through all those people, once you see it on TV, it might look slightly different from what you originally came up with. So I always say uh, this. This means I'm married to Jennifer. I'm not married to any of my materials. Oh, Just lovely. Let them, That's great. Let them do whatever they want with it. They, as long as they yeah. pay me. So. I always say yeah. my writing's not gold. It's just painted with gold spray paint. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> it yeah. all washes off. Um, <laughs> you know, you, Millionaire's not the only show that you've done. You also yeah. did a game show 
about student loans. You wrote for that. That aired for a couple yeah. of seasons. How does somebody come up with a game show about student <laughs> loans? It's funny you should ask. Uh, the, the show is called Paid Off with Michael Torpy. Michael Torpy was the host. Somebody you may recognize him. Uh, he was a character on Orange is the New Black. He was a really okay. mean, really mean guard. But he's a really nice guy. And uh, he's been working as an actor for a long time. And his parents paid for his college education. And when he got married, a few months or years after he got married, he did a commercial with Michael Jordan for Hanes underwear. People may even remember it. He's sitting there on an airplane. They're talking about underwear. Uh, that one commercial, he earned so much money from that that he was able to pay his wife's uh, student loans. And the day that he told her, he said, yeah, we're just going to we'll just pay that off. We have the money now. She, st she started to cry. And he had no idea up till then the, the burden that was on her shoulders from this debt. And that's when he started to learn about uh, the student debt crisis uh, that we're in. And he came up with the idea of a show where people could come on and they could, um, well, if you win the show, you pay off your student debt. But it was really sort of a social activism show where we tried to get, you know, get across the idea that it's not our job to do this. We shouldn't be doing this. Somebody else should take care of this problem. So it was a really great show, really fun. It's a comedy game show, and you can see it on HBO Max right now. Oh, that's cool. That sounds yeah. like a real good use of game show money to pay off yeah. student loans. <laughs> we thought so too, yeah. So John, in addition to a way with words, you're also, yeah. and I'm going to tread very carefully here, mm -hmm. because you're also working on this major secret project that yeah. I don't know how much I can say about. So why don't you just well, tell us what you can tell us about what you're doing? Sure. Well, of course, there's a hierarchy. You know, there's uh, there's cable paid off was on True TV, and then a uh, millionaire, of course, is on broadcast TV. But now, for the first time, I'm working for a streaming service, one of the big streaming services, and it's a brand new game show. And uh, I had to travel and uh, Writers Guild make sure I, I get to fly first class if I go over a thousand miles. Wow. So that was sweet, wow. and uh, that's all I can tell you about this new show, which you should <laughs> see. Uh, I was one of only three writers, so when you do look at the credits for this show, you will see my name there. But uh, it's it's also a comedy game show. It's very funny. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, yes. I'm sure it will be a big hit and and lots of fun. Fingers um, crossed. We've got a bunch of questions stacking up in the chat, but there was one that I wanted to ask you before we let you go. Melody, hi, Melody. I recognize your name. When did you first get into puzzles? I think you got involved with Games Magazine. You were kind of a hangers-on, right? I yeah, when I was when I was in uh, just I was still in high school, maybe in high school and college. Uh, luckily, Games Magazine, which was back you know back in the '80s and '90s, was the first really quality magazine that had uh, good paper, and the the people who were working on it were real trailblazers in the in the puzzle industry. They just happened to be located in New York City, and uh, I wanted to be in the magazine, so I and they had a column at the time called Your Move, where you could put it, they could send something in, they would publish it. But I didn't want to be in there. I wanted to be in the main part of the magazine. So I intentionally wrote a puzzle that was too big to fit in the column. Um, it was, a, 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 <laughs> yeah, I took a dollar bill and I photocopied it and I cut it up and, and I rearranged everything. You had to put it back in, back in order. And that was my first puzzle for Games Magazine. And uh, after a while, I just found reasons to go hang out at the office. And I met Will Shorts, who was, became the editor. Uh, of uh, Games Magazine, and it's through Will that I got a lot of other other work. That, uh, in fact, it was Will mentioning at a National Puzzlers League convention that there was this radio show looking for a puzzle guy uh, that uh, spurred me to uh, audition for you guys, and that's how I got this. That's wonderful. Well, we got to yeah. thank Will next time we talk to him. He's been on the show a couple of times, and he's a he's just a helper all around, isn't he? Yeah, he's a good guy. John, thank you for sharing some behind the scenes stuff with us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, guys. Anytime. And will you hang around in case people have questions for you? And feel free to just uh, jump in when we're discussing if you've got uh, something to add, OK? Of course. Thanks very much. And Josh, our moderator slash board president, has been scanning the chat looking for questions. Josh, do you have anything? I sure do. So please keep those coming in and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so I think I'm going to see if uh, Margaret here is uh, able to, to add a little more context, but she was asking about where does winner winner chicken dinner come from? 
Um, it sounds like she hadn't heard it before moving to uh, the Ohio Valley. And uh, Margaret, you want to add a little more context of you know where where did you hear it, and uh, are you using it yourself now? Um, hi, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we sure yes, we can. can. Hi, Margaret. Hi. hi, Margaret. Where are you? Um, I am in Newburgh, Indiana. That's in the southwest corner of Indiana. Yeah. But I am not from the Midwest originally. Okay. I'm originally from Puerto Rico via Pittsburgh, ending up in southwest Indiana. Okay. Um, and I heard it from somebody who has lived here all their life, and it was a in a positive um, context of um, of being excited about something. And he just said, winner, winner, chicken dinner. And I looked at him kind of like, <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> and he said, well, you've never heard of it? And kind of made me feel like I was totally out of the lingo. Uh, but since then, I've heard it um, on a couple of other occasions from people who have moved from other areas. So I don't know if it's a regional thing. Other than the fact that there's a positive connotation, I'm really not even sure what it means. Oh, lovely. This is a good one. Uh, I have heard this before. Martha, you? You know, I grew up in the Ohio Valley in Louisville, and I did not hear it until maybe 10 years ago for the first okay, time. Okay, that that's, yeah. makes some sense. It's not really regional, but it's actually more recent than you might think. The language devotees at the American Dialect Society and the etymologist and word historian Barry Popek have looked into this, and the earliest that they've found it in print is from the early 90s, and it seems to come from the lingo of craps games, so that when you roll something good and you win at the craps table, say in Vegas or Atlantic City, the, the guy, the stick man, as he's called, will, will shout something like, winner, winner, chicken dinner. You know, his goal is to keep this patter up, to keep the table excited and the dice rolling and the, and the bets going down. So it's just one of the many things that he says. Some people have suggested maybe it comes from the Depression era or Cockney rhyming slang. But if so, we have no print record of that. And so it's, it's, it's really only like the last 30 years or so that we really know anything about winner, winner, chicken dinner. And that's, that's, excuse me, that's interesting. I did not know the term stick man. That's the guy who's scraping the... Yeah, yeah that's right. The stick man. Yeah, he's scraping the stuff off the, off the, the dice off so he can get going again. So you can start oh, again. Interesting. So he's, he's keeping some patter, patter going. It's, it's like you and I, Grant, were talking the other day about bingo slang, you know, and, and mm -hmm. different uh, terms that you have uh, it, when you're, when you're in a bingo game, uh, like a really big one. And the guy's up there um, calling the numbers, you know, like B24 or whatever. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. 40, 40, there. who's your shorty, something like that. Yeah, he just, they come yeah. up with a whole bunch of these, um, yeah, the tons of these rhymes. Because yeah, otherwise so it's really the, boring. If all they're doing is calling out the winner, then it's boring. He's got to really keep you excited. Right, right. So I think there's, um, I think 22 is two little ducks because it sort of looks like little ducks. Quack, quack. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Thank you for that question, Margaret. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. How come they never say winner, winner, fidget spinner? How come it's, and I, I've never been, <laughs> I've never been given a chicken dinner, no matter how many times I win, I never actually get the chicken dinner. I'm right? I want a chicken pot pie or something. Sometimes yeah. if, if, the, if the pot is really low, put those, put that stack of cash on top of a real nice uh, chicken and dumpling hmm. plate. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I'm sure we've got, oh, the, yeah, the chat is filling up. And I want to say welcome to a few more people. We've got Margaret from Rocket City. That's Huntsville, Alabama, I believe, right? And who else do we have? Uh, Norfolk, Virginia as Allison and Patty in Denver. Lila in Yankton, South Dakota. Hi, Felicia in Temecula, California. Megan in Burlington, Vermont. And Marianne in Poway and Pam in Denton, Texas, just north of Dallas. Hello, everyone else. And keep those questions coming in the chat. What else do you got for us, Josh? Yeah, oh, and hi, Wendy in DC. Amy's got a question. So she joined us for the last cookout as well and, and uh, just want to make sure we get to it. Um, so uh, your parents used to say something was really, uh, if it was really big, it was the, something that ate Pittsburgh. Um, Amy, you want to give us a little more background? Yeah, so, 
Um, we It didn't come up a whole lot, but when something was really big and often it would be like, my dad was a really good challah baker. And if, if it rose like really, really high in the oven, we'd look at it and go, oh, that's the challah that ate Pittsburgh. We said it for some other things too. And I grew up in Colorado. My dad grew up in California. My mom grew up East Coast, Long Island. Um, so I don't know where it came from, but then I went to Pittsburgh for college and I always thought of that and I would wondered if it was just a family thing or where it came from. Ooh, that sounds familiar. Um, does anyone else remember? I know that he's, um, he's no longer, uh, on anyone's listen list, but when I was a kid, I had a lot of Bill Cosby albums memorized and he mm. had a routine about, uh, the chicken that ate Hoboken. John, you're from that those parts. You remember that? I am from Hoboken. Uh, I'm not sure if Bill Cosby's Bill Cosby's was Hoboken. I think it was something else. There was Daniel Daniel Pinkwater, the author, actually wrote a bunch of books about the chicken, uh, the chicken that swallowed Hoboken or crushed Hoboken. Uh, Cosby's was something different, but yeah, that is. Uh, oh, that it was the chicken heart. Chicken heart. It that's the, it. Yes, it that's right. Bill heart. Cosby was the chicken heart. Yeah. Let me look that up again. I wonder if those are related. That's that's my question. Martha, any of this ringing a bell for you? Not at all, but I, I do see that there's a, a book called The Zombies That Ate Pittsburgh of the film <laughs> George Romero. <laughs> I don't know if, if there are zombies in there. Maybe somebody else knows. That's, this is a new one on me. Yeah, uh, my question for you, who is, what's the caller's name? I'm sorry. I'm uh, are you there? Amy. <laughs> yeah. Amy, my question for you is, do you remember, was your father, this was your father who was saying this, right? It was both my parents. So I'm not both sure parents. who started it. It was just sort of a family phrase. Were they the kind of people who were clever with language and, and making these kinds of expressions pretty often? Yeah, some, I mean, they're definitely both well-read and well-spoken and you, my mom has like a Broadway lyric for everything that you could possibly <laughs> understand. But, um, I love that. Yeah. Amy, my question is, do you have a good holla recipe you can share with us? Oh my God. <laughs> yes. My dad's is pretty fantastic. Yeah. It's okay. like three and a half cups of flour. He, it's like a third of a cup of sugar, a little bit of yeast. Um, it's just enough sugar, so it's not too sweet, but um, it's sugar just is the key, yeah. yeah. That. So it looked like the yeah, there was yeah, the zombies that ate Pittsburgh comes up again and again. This was a film from 1987. I wonder if that's where he got the idea. Mm -hmm. I wonder because, yeah, they're not big zombies, and there was um. Cool. And I see mentioned in a, a magazine from 1974, it's strange, uh, uh, just the phrase describing a fast car as the wasp that ate Pittsburgh, and it's in all capital letters, as if it's a thing, but I find no other mentions of the wasp that ate Pittsburgh. Isn't that really odd? It's it very odd to me. The Daniel Pinkwater connection, because... Uh, Borgle is one of my favorite books, and I feel like no one ever talks about it. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's clear that people have this thing for for unusual objects eating large cities. Yeah. I don't know I if it's out of affection for those cities or distaste. Especially the fish that ate Pittsburgh, the pothole that ate Pittsburgh. It's it's <laughs> the X of eight Y. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you. I find this go back to, I've found something back to 1974. It's a movie called The Cars That Ate Paris. So it, it, it goes back, 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 yeah. Well, as the scholars say, clearly further research is needed. We yeah, that's a good one. Marianne says The Cockroach That Ate Cincinnati, a novelty poem. We're gonna have oh. to find that and read that one on the show. <laughs> To... Um, somebody's asking me about the books behind me. This, I'm afraid, this is just a, a an image that I got off of a public domain image site. If you look carefully, you can see that these are actually library books because they all have the little thing. But I do have hundreds and hundreds of dictionaries. They're just not visible <laughs> behind me. And these are my actual books behind me. Um, for a really big donation, I might give you a tour of my office. But uh, but this is this is the good part right here. <laughs> 
Let's uh, flip over to talk about Carl's question. Uh, Carl, I think you've unmuted. Um, you had a question uh, that was interesting about what makes the spelling of some languages more phonetic than others? And I guess this, of course, is all predicated on the language using an alphabet um, in, in the way that English does. But uh, yeah, any, any more background on that, Carl? Oh, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Yes. Um, well, what happened was I, I came across someone on social media saying that it was sort of hypocritical to uh, complain about languages for, or names rather from like the Middle East or Africa being hard to pronounce when people don't say the same thing about like the name Leicestershire. And I replied <laughs> to that and said, you know, don't forget about which is a town in Wales which a lot of people don't know how to pronounce. And somebody you, you replied just, and, sorry? You just amazed me. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. impressive. Carl, where are you, by the way? Wales. I'm in Vancouver. Um, <laughs> no, no, but like somebody replied to that and said, you know, that doesn't really count because if you know the Welsh alphabet, it's, it's completely phonetic, which is true. The Welsh alphabet mm -hmm. is pretty phonetic, but, you know, the question of whether you know, you take the time to learn it uh, like I have, or, you know, have a normal interest is uh, another one. But anyway, I was wondering why that is, why the Welsh uh, alphabet is more phonetic than, say, English. Wow. Uh, I'm no expert on Welsh, Grant. Do you have well, I won't. I won't say anything about Welsh, but I will say that each language has its own life, mm. and some languages have have academies behind them that actually go out of their way to regularize them. Spanish is one of those, for example, that has had a, a royal academy for a long time, um, and but it hasn't always. It hasn't always been consistent. Uh, for example, the H being pronounced or not pronounced, or the R changing pronunciation, or words that used to have an F in front of them now have an H in front of them, things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, that's the problem with English is our pronunciations have changed where they used to be consistent. They used to be pretty straight on. But um, literacy spread in a way that the word you could read how, how can i phrase this you could read the words in your own local dialect and say them and still be understood english has never really had a problem with sounding very different from your neighbor and it being okay just the same way we've never really had a major problem with words being kind of approximate you know to read and to say a word like dough or tough may look like they ended the same thing but there's an etymological history there um which frankly makes my job and martha's job a lot easier we can <laughs> we can chase them out so i guess what i'm saying is english is this um english isn't the only one that has this but english's history is really interesting in that um when we look at the spelling inconsistencies in english uh, we're not the first to try to change it i just found a book the other day where somebody in the 1970s had decided that they were going to change the spelling of English once and for all. And they've got all these ways they're going to simplify the spelling of English and we should all stick to it. But like every single other person that wanted to change the spelling of English so that the spelling represented pronunciation, they chose their own pronunciation. They didn't go to a Scotsman and say, let's use your pronunciation or a Jamaican or an Indian, an Indian from India and say, let's use your. No, they chose their pronunciation. And that's always the problem. We probably never will have regularization unless we split the language into multiple languages and just politically decide that they're different languages and go our own way. And this is a really good opportunity to recommend a book that we're going to be talking about on this weekend's show, which is by linguist Erica Okrent, and is called Highly Irregular, Why Tough, Through, and Doe Don't Rhyme and Other Oddities of the English Language. Uh, it's a wonderful romp through the history of English, and it talks about exactly uh, this kind of thing, J just what a hot mess English is in terms of spelling, <laughs> but the reasons it evolved that way. And yeah, so, that's Erica with an A, A-R-I-K-A. Yeah, and the book is Highly Irregular, Why Tough, Through, and Doe Don't Rhyme and Other Oddities of the English Language. So you can check that out before we talk about it. 
anyway, I know that was a mess of an answer, but uh, like Martha said, the language is a hot mess. I think my answer was appropriate. No, no, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. And I, I want to direct everyone's attention in the chat to David, who's shared the, the actual uh, spelling of, of the, uh, the Welsh town. I'll say it is different from how Zoom decided to translate it in the transcript. <laughs> We're following the, the auto transcription, closed captioning. Nice. Uh, so next, I thought we'd uh, take a question from, uh, from Valentine about why are corner stores in Western Massachusetts called spas? Um, you know, I, of course, being a Simpsons fan, always refer to, to any of them as a, a quickie mark, um, even if they're not officially branded that way. But uh, Valentine, you want to add a little more? background on when, when you first started hearing that? Yeah, well, first I, I want to say that English spells spells and pronounces funny because it's a mutt. I, have, yeah. I think we have more mixed ancestry than any other language. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's, the, it's the, definitely the a Heinz 57. All, the contributing languages are all arguing with each other. Um, <laughs> I used to live in Springfield, Massachusetts at the Pioneer Valley. I'm in Hartford, Connecticut now. Um, the Pioneer Valley is that part of the Connecticut River Valley that has, happens to lie within the state lines of Massachusetts and they didn't want to use the C word. <clears throat> um, and the corner store was called the so-and-so spa. And then I noticed that little local stores in other parts of the state were also called spas and I've never seen that anywhere else. So does anybody have any opinion on why that happens? Yeah, the, the theory is that it's actually just like a spa where you get a facial or a massage. It, it, all of these spas come from the same sport, so, source, which is this resort in <laughs> Belgium called spa spa a place of relaxation uh, they were no, it was known for its mineral waters these uh, waters naturally occurring waters with lots of uh, uh, minerals in them and so if you go to a soda fountain what do you get you get a variety of different carbonated drinks and and carbonated waters and of course a corner store today isn't very much like a soda fountain but that is that's their parentage you know a corner store comes from that old idea of a, a soda fountain with a few little bits of treats that you can buy and so as far back as the um 1800s you can find it mentioned not only in massachusetts but also in pennsylvania as a, a place where you might get uh, treats or meals or, or food or drinks and i guess my question for you is did you drink cabinets there I couldn't drink anything there. They didn't have any. They didn't serve stuff by the time I came along. Oh, okay. But gotcha. if I had yeah. drunk a cabinet, what would it be? Well, it'd be a milkshake, as I recall. Isn't that isn't that right? It's um, it's uh, often in Rhode Island and parts of Massachusetts as well. There there are traditional milkshakes that are supposedly so named because uh, the the person at the soda fountain there in the store would turn around and get. Uh, ingredients out of the cabinet yeah uh -huh. ice and soda water and egg and and and, and cream and flavorings um you, you, kind you of mean, basically unlike, an, unlike it unlike egg creams that actually did contain eggs and cream <laughs> oh yeah you had egg creams eh no they have them in new york right <clears throat> but they don't have eggs or cream correct no we couldn't get anything to eat or drink there except candy and the irascible owner would get furious at the little kids who couldn't decide how to spend their nickel and he'd say, what do you want, my blood? <laughs> <laughs> and Valentine, thank you for your question. We really appreciate it. All yours. You know, Grant and Martha, uh, there's a there was a famous store in the East Village of, Man of Manhattan uh, about a block from where I live called the Gem Spa. It opened in 1957 and it just closed. So everybody was up in arms because it was this famous landmark. It was a new Stan Candy store in New York. Mm. Yep, I bet that's a, a related, right? Just the idea of a place where you go to recuperate or feel better. Yeah. But, you know, you go by getting your sugar bomb. And you could get a, uh, a any cream there for sure. Let's jump to a question from Craig, who asks, in German and English, you can say man oh man or boy oh boy, um, and asking, are we familiar with any similar phrases, but with uh, women or girls um, involved? Craig, how, how do you use that uh, 
Yeah, well, I, I oh. hi, Grant and Martha. It's nice to see you. They, hi, you Grant. were in Arcata just a little while ago. We got to yeah, talk. Yeah, a lovely visit oh, there. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I speak German and English, and and you know, you can say man, oh man, or in German you can say ach Mensch, ach Mensch, and Junge, Junge. That's a real you know, literally just as boy, boy. And I realized I was very curious about why we don't have a girl girl or a woman woman or something that at least you know is is as common in as a as kind of a just the just it's not an epithet it's just i mean just an expression and i was look, wondering if you were aware of any other languages that did that i'm not uh Um, I mean, I, I, I would I would blame the patriarchy on it, but I, just yeah. because the idea that you're you're calling notice by quote general people, but they're all going to be men or they're all going to be boys, and so that was something that I I was just curious about that why why that happens. Yeah, there's a book in them from the 1970s that specifically calls out English. Uh, it's folk speech as being chauvinistic, male chauvinistic, uh, because we do have things just like you say is, oh boy, oh brother, or man, but we don't have the analogy of oh girl, or sister, or woman. However, you can say, oh sister, or oh girl, given the context, but we don't use it mm -hmm. generically. Um, we don't use it like, uh, oh man, I can't believe my car died. Um, well, if we were saying, oh sister, or oh girl, we probably are literally talking to another person. Um, and not talking in general about a situation. Yeah, I so, think yeah, your language you, is is a, is a history of of patriarchy and uh, yeah, and boring women. Or or I mean, you start just nosing through the dictionary, and there are all these der derogatory terms for women uh, as opposed to men, and terms that have survived. I'm, I'm blanking on on one that's used currently, but. Uh, you start digging around and, and there are so many definitions in, for example, the Oxford English Dictionary for, you know, a garrulous or, or gossiping woman, that kind of thing. And you don't, you don't see that for guys. No, no. Um, and generally, if you do see something like, oh, girl, again, it's just specifically talking to a girl or, girl, or, yeah. or, 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 or a man that you're calling a girl. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't know of any other languages that do that, but thank you for your question, Greg. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. All right, let's flip over and uh, talk about something that Michelle uh, posed in the chat um, about her grandmother phrase, grandmother's phrase, uh, a monkey is getting married when the sun was out. Um, but oh it, yeah, that's great. <laughs> is, is Michelle there? Hi, can you Hi. hear me? Sure can. Yeah. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from La Jolla. Hi, local. Oh, Hi. <laughs> Practically see you. Yeah, just I, I wish you could. I know. Martha, I keep telling you to come down to the rowing club and start rowing again. Oh, well, now, <laughs> that depends. I know that there are two rowing clubs up there in La Jolla, just north of me in San Diego. And and there's one that's really hardcore. And then the one, the one that's more relaxed. So well, which one are you in? ZLAC, Z L A C. It's the it's the oldest women's rowing club in the world, from what we've been told. Oh my goodness! Wow. And and, and it's a it's in uh, Mission Beach. Uh huh. And uh, there are some of them that are very hardcore, and then there are some of us that are less hardcore. Okay, because so, I would be <laughs> I would definitely be in the leisurely boat. Yes, and um, those people do not start at five a.m. So we would love you to join us. Oh, well, that's even better. <laughs> I'll yeah, well, I, I used to, yeah, I used to row uh, a lot on the Ohio River in uh, in Louisville when I lived there, and and it's it's a, a glorious sport. I absolutely love it. So maybe one of these days I'll get out. But, there. but tell us about time. monkeys' I'll weddings. Have you as my guest, but um, yeah, my grandmother was from South Africa, from um, uh, Durban, and she would always. But she moved to Akron, Ohio, um, back in uh, post war. And she would always say, uh, a monkey's getting married. Whenever the sun was out the, and it started to rain. 
So my mother taught me that phrase. I've taught my kids that phrase and I say it now whenever it happens mm -hmm. and people look at me like I have, you know, two heads. So I just um, would love to know a little more detail about why is a monkey getting married when the sun is out and it's raining? That is a great question. Um, and it has to do with just the fact that it's this weird, supernatural, uh, not usual kind of thing. You know, if, if you have both rain and sunshine at the same time, <clears throat> and um, what's really fascinating is that there are lots and lots and lots of different examples of this uh, throughout the world. Uh, I think in Arabic, you say the jackals are getting married and, and uh, in Russian, I believe it's called mushroom rain for some reason, but, uh, but quite often in different countries, um, it, it has to do with just uh, creatures that you wouldn't expect to be getting married to get married. And it has to do with that, that strangeness of the combination. I know Grant just, th this, this is what Grant's, uh, <laughs> our, our relationship is like this. The other day he got all excited and sent me a long list of Turkish sayings that are- I, I came across a list <laughs> in French from a journal printed in Helsinki in 1958 of That's variations <laughs> of folklore expressions for this exact thing. Yeah. And so I, I translated it, uh, I automatically translated it. I do speak, read French, but I translated it into English and sent it to Martha. And there's a bunch of these apparently from village to village in Turkey at the time, it could change. So if it's raining and the sun is shining, you could say the angels are sweeping paradise or it's the wedding mm, of an like orphan that. girl because she laughs and cries at the same time or the daughters of paradise weave carpets, a, a doe, like a, a female deer gives birth. Um, a fox celebrates its wedding. I mean, there's just so many of these. Mm -hmm. but do yeah. we have anything in, in English? Uh, here, here in the great states, do we say anything like that for that weather phenomenon? Well, we you know, besides a... monkey's wedding, there's we pretty widespread in the South, there's, there's the unfortunate phrase, the devil is beating his wife, or the devil is beating his wife with a frying pan, which is, uh, again, we hope supernatural and not real. Um, but, mm -hmm. but we get to that question fairly often, don't we, Grant? Yeah, sometimes it's a lot of times it is about two animals getting married who shouldn't be getting married, like a, a donkey and a, and a fox or something like that. But yeah, the some of them involve the devil and his wife not beating each other. But yeah, but but generally these are kind of fading in, into folklore. They're becoming rarer as uh, our pop culture tends to replace our folklore as the kind of the currency of um, of metaphor that we use from day to day. Yeah, I believe I saw a, a survey, a dialect survey once that um, that found that the most common expression in the U.S. is just sun shower, which isn't that uh, that yeah exciting. sun shower. But, uh, but that's a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. Thank you. Happy rowing. Yes, I'll reach out to you privately. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> It's been a while. <laughs> uh, let's take a question that just came in from David, who asked, why is the phrase shrimp on the barbie associated with Australia, even though Australians typically use prawn instead of shrimp? <laughs> I do want to go back and say that Craig remembered an expression after we got done talking to him uh, where women are used as a, an expression of uh, an interjection of surprise or delight in mamma mia is one mm. yeah and i think other languages may do ver variations on the mother mary or virgin mary and things like that mm -hmm. so shrimp on the barbie when when in general people in us well we have so many aussies here tell us <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah do, do you call it the you? barbie first of all australians <laughs> yeah, there, there are a lot of those diminutive terms in, in Aus Australian uh, English, like, like Barbie and Brecky and... Yeah, Melody right. says they do call it the Barbie, and, uh, yeah. they, but you're more likely to call them prawns instead of shrimp, right? Melody says we never use shrimp. Yep, and she says yep. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of the problem. It's one of those this not quite thing. Um, and if you look at, a, there's a book called Modern Australian Usage by Nicholas Hudson. Um, 
he talks about this commercial where Paul Hogan, who played Crocodile Dundee, which was a huge movie, including in the United States, he uses the expression shrimp on the Barbie in some American commercials. And Australians, as this Nicholas Hudson writes, would never dream of doing that. So it's an expression that should be avoided. If you use it to an Australian as an idea that Australians say that, you're just going to sound ridiculous. It's just, it's just kind of like thinking, thinking that British people say, um, you know, pip pip cherry-o, uh, you know, that right. thing, I just, they don't really, or that- Bumber shoots, right? Bumber shoot, yeah. <laughs> Those commercials with uh, Paul Hogan from the Australian Tourism Commission were from 1984 to 1990, and he said uh, specifically, I'll slip another shrimp on the barbie for you. That's what he said, you yeah. know. Oh, there's my trivia master. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would not be surprised if those were the source of that getting very popularized in the United States. Right. Is this well, a, uh, a question from, from Bruce, and Bruce, uh, feel free to unmute and, and jump in. Um, but I guess it's it's as much about kind of pet peeves as anything else. Uh, is there a particular word that irks you, Martha and Grant and, and John, uh, when it's mispronounced? And uh, I know you, you're often talking against pet peeves, but uh, let's, let's turn Well, no, first of all, we like to think of ourselves as a spay and neuter program for pet peeves because, uh, <laughs> you know, pronunciation can be political too, you know? I mean, yeah. you, you may you may think that you have the right, uh, pronun the right pronunciation, but it, it often depends on, on where you are, who's doing the talking. Um, there are lots of different pronunciations for for a particular word, and and it's it's for for various words, and um, it's it's a, a risk to claim otherwise to claim that you know the the correct pronunciation of this or that word often. And once you set the precedent that you know the correct pronunciation for one word, you better have your act together for every word. Yeah. So be careful setting yourself up as some kind of expert. Certainly Martha and I have discovered that. Boy, we get we get it, it gets known when we get something wrong. Oh, but yeah. uh, to elaborate on what Martha was saying, the, the miscorrections aren't nearly as bad as the corrections that come weighted with the freight of history where they include biases about gender and race and class and um and ethnocentrism and things like that you just have to be aware that if you're correcting someone you might be coming from a place that has a lot of cultural baggage and you are signaling things that have nothing to do with pronunciation so anyway to answer your question the only word that bothers me is strength pronounced strength just because that just because I don't know why, but I don't think it's wrong. It's just I don't do that, and for some reason it just bothers me. And I, it's completely irrational. And I don't I never correct anyone. It, and I don't like you know, I make a mental red mark next to their name or anything. It just I just it bothers me. That's so funny that you say that, Grant, because that was my mother was an English teacher. She taught uh, junior high English, and um, strength was one of her. Um, she she would actually go to the blackboard back when there were blackboards and take her fingernails and run it down the blackboard and say uh. what that sounds like to me when you say strength and length. But it's just a, a variation. Yeah, it's just a variation. A little more common on the East Coast, as I remember. Mm -hmm. um, before we wrap this up, which will happen soon, I want to make sure we get to this question from Adelina in the second grade, who is asking in chat about dictionaries that I have. Can we get Adelina, Josh, and talk to her? Uh, this is uh, M. Agradecida. 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 Yes. Uh, there you go. You should be able to unmute if you. Hello. 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 Adelina. Come here. Okay. Adelina is uh, not ready to talk, so I'm going to be her spokesperson. Uh, my <laughs> okay, name is uh, Araceli Noriega. Uh, hello. Hi. Where are you? Oh, you're the one. Are you the one in the in the Bronx? Correct. Excellent. Yes. It's nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you guys too. I'm visiting uh, some friends, and one of them is. Adelina and her brother Micah and Adelina was curious because I was kind of uh, uh, talking a lot about your uh, lexicography experience grant and so she wanted to know what uh, how many dictionaries do you have and maybe talk a little bit about your work. 
Um, I have hundreds and hundreds of dictionaries. I have started to call them down the paper ones and go to 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 uh, digital when I can. Uh, but a lot of things aren't digitized and will never be digitized, uh, even though archive.org uh, does try to keep up the Internet Archive, but there's still there's a ton of stuff that you simply can't find. I'll show you some stuff that I recently got. I got this dictionary of Utah slang, which is cool. pretty interesting. I got this book of uh, Shetland dialect word book. <laughs> wow. I got another one of Shetland dialect words here, <laughs> this one here. Wow. Um, I got this book. Uh, this is a is literally a classic. <laughs> this is about naughty restroom slang from the 1920s. Um, what else do I have? Oh, this is a Scots playground language, rhymes and, and games and stuff. This is a book of miners slang from South Africa, kind of a, a pigeon language actually used by miners. Somebody sent me this and I, I lost their name, but this oh, is uh, some Pennsylvania German language. And I, mean, I have a ton more. Here's two books uh, for language of, oh, look at that green screen. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. Newf Newfoundland English. Uh, Newfoundland writing. English, and then there's this one, another one, Dictionary of Newfoundland Whoa. and Labrador, and so those are just a few of the ones that I've I've gotten recently. I do try to keep my habit in check, but I'm also a believer in if you like something, if you want something to exist, you have to support it. And I love bookstores, and I want them to exist, so I do support them. That's awesome. So those are just a few of the things. That was a very quick tour of just some recent <laughs> things that I that I've added to my collection. Thank you for sharing. Hi, Adelina. Adelina. Hi, Adelina. Thank you for the question. She, what do you want to say back? She says thank you, too. Oh, OK. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. We're coming up on uh, the end of the hour here. Um, maybe a, a good good one to kind of close this out is, John, I think, uh, intended for you, um, asking about the, the trickiest puzzle you've seen, or maybe a, a source of particularly tricky puzzles that, uh, that that you like to go to or refer people to? Oh, refer people to, oh, uh, I, I, there's, you know, that's like saying, you know, where's a good place to go see a baseball game? I mean, it's to go all over the place. Uh, I, I like puzzle hunts. I like, uh, you know, complicated escape rooms where you have to figure out different puzzles and use the answers from the earlier puzzles to put into a, a, a bigger puzzle, which we call a meta puzzle or meta answer. Uh, I've been to the MIT mystery hunt a couple of times. I've been on the team that's created the MIT mystery hunt. Um, I have uh, friends who create escape rooms that you can play online on Zoom. Uh, you know, text me, uh, contact me, and I'll let you know which ones I think are great. Cool. Thanks, John. Sure. Yeah, the uh, the real world components that I've just the, the verbal word play from from the show with the escape rooms. Fun mix. Cool. Well, Grant, Martha, that's certainly not all the questions uh, that came in the chat, uh, but I think that's probably about all we can probably get to today. Um, I guess, what, what else do you want to tell people before we close out? Well, I just want to say thank you for such great questions. Um, as, as Grant and I like to say, we're always looking for material for the show, and you never know what might end up on the show. Some of these questions um, that were asked in the chat might end up um, being addressed on the show as well. Um, and you're always, always welcome to call us any time of the day or night because you'll get voicemail, um, and you can ask your question, and um, you may get a call back uh, to be on the show. That number. Let's all say it together, 877-929-9673, or send us an email. That address is words at waywardradio.org. And we appreciate it. I want to thank everyone uh, personally for all of your really kind emails. Uh, Martha and I appreciate those, although we also appreciate your donations. We know that not everyone can make a donation, but your kind words and support of what we do and your appreciation of how we put out a um what we try to make a kind show that embraces everyone and uh at, at the same time you don't have to turn off your brain uh thank you for noticing and thank you thank you for um giving that back to us and i really appreciate that it's nice to open the email box and to listen to the voicemails and hear warm hearts and generous spirits And, and with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Josh, thank you. John, thank you. Martha, love you. Thank you, too. Thanks, Take everybody. Take care, everyone. And Thanks, we'll do guys. this again sometime.
If you've got a question that didn't get answered today, feel free to send it to us in email, okay? Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.